In the Gospel lesson today, uh, we have sort of the bookend that we've been talking about for a couple of weeks. Remember, over the last couple of weeks, we talked about the Gospel of Mark and how Mark has this little literary device where he sandwiches one story in the middle of two parts of another story so that he wants to make a specific point and that most of the points that Mark is making is about discipleship. Manual for how to be a disciple. And so today, we get the bookend, the second part, that we heard about a couple weeks ago when Jesus called the disciples to himself and he sent them out, two by two. And he said, go tell the story. Go tell them what you see and hear, what I've been teaching you, uh, all the great works that you've seen. Tell the people about that and then come back. And so today, we hear the opening of this particular lesson that they came back. And Jesus was such a kind person. He didn't simply say to them, oh, now that you're back, we have more work to do, get busy. He said, well, let's go away with me. Let's go rest for a while. That's called the Sabbath rest. And God put that rhythm into our life for a purpose. Because all of us can grow weary, whether we are busy about our daily lives or about the work of the gospel or both, we hope, and it doesn't really matter which, that basically God wants us once in a while, on a regular basis, just to relax. Good thing I'm just sort of back from a time away because I wouldn't have had the presence of mind to do all of that technical stuff, but that's why we rest. But like the best laid plans, Jesus had a plan for his disciples to go off and rest, and yet the people, they just wouldn't let go. They kept coming to Jesus. They kept crowding on Jesus. Maybe the disciples did too good a job, and they were telling people how wonderful this Jesus person is, and how many wonderful things he teaches, and how many wonderful things he does, like healing them that they said, this is our opportunity. And so they bring their sick to Jesus in large numbers. You know, Mark does it again today. He sticks another story in the middle. But today, the authors of the lectionary, the people who pick which readings we're going to listen to, they didn't let Mark get away with it this time. They took the story that's in the middle out. And there's a reason for that. So the lesson we have is, again, one bookend becomes actually the front end of another pair of stories. And we hear the last part of how Jesus, when he got over to the other side of the lake, they came and they beat him there. They ran to him. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about running to Jesus. The bit that the church took out in this lectionary passage, if you look at your references in the bulletin, you've got a whole bunch of verses that are just eliminated in the middle. Actually, it's the story of the feeding of the multitude. We sometimes call it the multiplication of loaves or loaves and fishes, depending on which story you're reading. And they left it out. The reason is because we're going to start reading that story, not from Mark, but from John. And trust me, John will go on and on and on. For the next five weeks, we're going to hear about John chapter 6. We call it the bread of life discourse. And in point of fact, those of us in ministry for many years, we call it one Sunday after another, oh, here we go, John chapter 6. The Bread of Life Discourse, chapter 143. Because it just seems to go on and on. It almost sounds like it's being repetitious. It's not, and we'll find that out. But the church sort of excised the feeding of the multitude from Mark's text, because we're going to get to it eventually. But I want to bring it back and put it back in the middle because we don't really understand Mark without it. And so think of that story. You all know it well, Jesus taking a few loaves and feeding this vast throng. Because the key word that I want you to focus on today is a word smack dab in the middle of today's lesson. And it's just before we get 
the story of the feeding. And the word is compassion. That is a critical word for Christians. Compassion. We, I'm afraid, in our day and age, don't really understand this word. The word is a Latin cognate, as it's known. It is, in fact, a conjunctive word because there are two different words sort of pasted together. The first one is passio, which is the word, Latin word for suffering. And the first one is cum, cum, which means wit. And in English, we put it all together and we come up with the word compassion. So in the most simple definition of this word, it means suffering with. Suffering with. But you see, we even miss the richness of that because we use the word suffering in a much more narrow sense than the old English uses of that word. You remember that word when Jesus, the disciples are trying to keep the kids away from Jesus, and he says, suffer the little children to come unto me. Well, if we think suffering is about pain, maybe Jesus is saying to the parents, don't worry about your pain. Give me the kids for a while. You can take a rest. That's not what's happening. The word suffer there is actually means giving permission. It means living with. It means, allow them to be with me. So Jesus looks on this crowd that's gathered, and he looks on them with compassion. And then he says, because they seem to be sheep without a shepherd. Now, I know we've talked about sheep before. We know that sheep are not the brightest, they get a bad rap. I mean, they're not exactly totally without any knowledge, but in fact, they need a little help along the way. And if they don't have a shepherd, what happens is they tend to wander off. And if they tend to wander off, they put themselves in harm's way. And in putting themselves in harm's way, they may actually end up being eaten by another creature, whether it's a sheep stealer, a person, or it's a wolf or some other animal of prey, they are at risk. So that's what Jesus is seeing. He's seeing these people. They're lost. He sees their faces. They're suffering in the pain sense of the term. They, they have sick people in their families. And in the day of Jesus, you know, being sick was seen as one of two things. The biggest thing that they saw was it is a punishment for sin. And so those that were bringing their sick to Jesus were seeking not only the physical healing, the physical cure, taking their disease or their malady away, they wanted to be restored to righteousness and to life. This is what Jesus sees in their faces. And so he has compassion. A really old translation of this gospel lesson says he had pity on them. Now, there, there's really an old word for pity, too. And again, we use it in a sort of condescending way. You know, I'm having pity on you. you know, type thing. The word as it was used even in that translation is very much like compassion. It was pity in the sense of, I see that you have a problem. What can I do to help? What can I do to make it better? That's what pity meant in that translation. There's another word, too, that we use rather glibly, and that's the word sympathy. It's actually the same word as compassion, only it's not Latin, it's Greek. Two words again, the first one being pathos, which is this sense of the soul feeling of an individual, and sin, S-Y-N, which means together. So we have the same meaning again, yet in a different language. So we have sympathy, compassion, pity. And they all mean the same thing. 
But the key thing for us is to realize that Jesus is expressing this compassion and then he goes and takes care of them. He feeds them. And then we hear at the closing verses of today's lesson that he teaches them many things. So he takes care of both the needs of their body and of the soul. That's what compassion does. It's not just feeling sorry for someone. It moves us to action. So that for the disciples of Jesus, if we are to follow the way of Jesus, we ourselves are being called to follow the pattern of Jesus' life. And if Jesus sees this crowd with all of their ill and sickness and all of that, and the worry on their faces, all of that, and he has compassion on them, that is what we are to do. That is to be our identity as the deliverers of compassion to a broken world. Jesus, Jesus moves among them, and again, even like the story we heard from a couple weeks ago, the woman who was bleeding, she wanted to touch just the hem of his cloak because there were tassels at the bottom, and we're even told about the the trim on the cloak in this particular lesson, they wanted to touch the tassels because the tassels on the cloak of a Jewish man in Palestine at that time was a symbol of their dedication to the Torah, to the law of God. And so these people realized that Jesus was so dedicated to living out that law of God that if they just touched the symbol of it, they too would be made righteous again. They too would find healing, all because of the compassion of Jesus. The people wanting to touch his garment are the people who have just been fed. So they know that Jesus cares. We are called to be the body of Christ in the world. We are called to become one with Christ and Christ one with us. We hear that in the prayers at the altar. We are called to be the very presence of Jesus for the people in our day, in our world, in our community. We are called to be the compassionate one for one another in this room right now, in this moment. And in exercising that compassion one for the other, we show the world the core, the very heart of what Jesus is about. It is the very center of what Jesus did. Jesus' compassion was so complete that he cared about the other so much that ultimately he gave his life on the cross. St. Paul tells us in the letter to the Philippians, he emptied himself completely, even to death, death on a cross. We are being called to put off ourselves. <laughs> you know, we used to have bookstores, those of us, a certain age. You used to go browse in bookstores. You can still do that once in a while when you find one. Otherwise, you have to browse online, and that's not quite as interesting. But the category was always self-improvement. It was all about the self. That's our modern problem, is we are constantly about ourselves. Self-care, self-improvement, self-this, self-that. And the very core of Jesus' message is to put off the self. That is the heart of compassion. Because when you are with another, when you suffer with another, when you invite yourself into another's life, you are putting yourself on the side and saying that that person is the most important thing to you in this moment. That's what Jesus was doing to the crowd. He wasn't thinking about, ooh, I'm going to make this great miracle. It's going to make me a really cool guy. And it's going to make me someone that everybody's going to want to follow. No, he saw them and he had compassion. He saw their pain. He felt their pain. And he wanted to fix it. He knew simply feeding them bread was not going to be enough. 
And so he begins to teach them from the Word of God. He begins to teach them the Torah, the law of God, which we know is ultimately the law of love. When we use the right one liturgy, we remind ourselves of that. The two great commandments are, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then Jesus says, and the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So if Jesus was teaching them about the law or the prophets, he was teaching them that law of love. And it is that law of love which is ultimately the goal of compassion. And my brothers and sisters, if we have been listening to Mark's gospel through these many weeks, we have been hearing about how Mark understands a disciple becomes like Jesus. And the ultimate likeness to Jesus is to put off oneself, even unto death, even death on a cross. Perhaps we will never be called to do that as a proof of our compassion, of our sympathy, of our pity. But in the meantime, we have every opportunity to grow deeper, wider, into this wonderful life of Jesus. And as we do that, we begin to see, as St. Paul told us in today's epistle lesson, all that God has for us, that we have been adopted as God's children, and the very reward, if you will, the very inheritance that Jesus had as the Son of God is ours. Rejoice. Be glad. Give thanks. That's what we do here at Eucharist. And as we go to the table and we take to ourselves a morsel of bread and we acknowledge and say amen, we are saying, let that compassion be me. Let me give up myself that others may live. Let me be the compassion of God. Call order? Yes not without hope because we truly believe that it is the Spirit of God that calls us here it is the Spirit of God that dwells in our hearts it is the Spirit of God with which we are marked at our baptism that makes us God's children so we have every right to claim the very strength of that Spirit in all that we do in the name of God May that strength be yours. May you have the courage and the wisdom that you need to grow in compassion, not only for one another, but for a world that needs it so badly, a world that too often seems like sheep without a shepherd.